Throughout the years, I've spent a lot of time reading books about music and how to get great musical ideas and learn. So I thought it would be a really, really cool idea if I would talk about some of the books that I've read throughout the years and what I've learned from them. Today, I think I'll start with a book called Casals and the Art of Interpretation by David Bloom. Pablo Casals, of course, was a great cellist, but more than that, he was a great teacher and a great musician. He conducted and he came up with a lot of ideas that are really useful to all of us. So I'd like to go through a few of those ideas and see if maybe they can help you. I thought to myself, what's the best way to talk about these and what's the best way to demonstrate what Casals has to say or what any artist has to say? Well, the best way that I'd look at these things is by playing and thinking about really, really simple phrases and simple pieces and putting things to work that way. And that way, when I play more difficult things, I can still use those same concepts that I learned, but I can solidify those concepts when I'm playing something a little bit more simple. So I'm going to use the first Suzuki book or two as my demonstration pieces and talk about some concepts that would really help people develop themselves into great musicians. The first thing that I learned from Casals and the Art of Interpretation is that music always has a line and a direction. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, each phrase is like a sentence. In other words, it's made of a bunch of notes, but we can kind of think of it as being a bunch of words that make sense, a complete thought. So when the simplest way to look at things in Pablo Casal's mind is that as a general rule, when the notes ascend or go up, A, B, C, D, E, like this, like so, that you should make a crescendo. And when they go down or descend, that you should make a diminuendo. Of course, Mr. Casals is very careful to tell us that this is not a rule to be followed all the time, but just most of the time. And it's a good general rule to follow. So let's take a look at a piece. How about Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star? That's the simplest piece that most string players know. And see how when the notes go up, we crescendo, and when they go down, that we diminuendo. So I'm just going to play a phrase of that and put that into our mix. <laughs> Well, that reminds me of another concept from this book, and that is a diminuendo, or the diminuendo, is the life of the music. What does he mean by that? I was always, always wondering, since I heard that when I was really young, what does Casals mean by that? Diminuendo is the life of music. Well, after many years, I kind of came up with the idea that when we make a crescendo, it's not that difficult. It's easier to get louder. But it's much more difficult to get softer. It takes a lot more artistry to make a diminuendo in my mind than it does to make a crescendo. As we make a diminuendo, we need to become much more refined and we need to make sure that we don't get sleepy and stop vibrating or stop being musical. So the diminuendo becomes the real true vision of an artist. My favorite thing that I learned in Casals and the Art of Interpretation by far is the following quote. Music, in general, is a succession of rainbows. That is so profound. What is a rainbow? A rainbow is an arc. A rainbow goes from low to high and back to low. 
And there are different shapes of rainbows in my mind, just from my imagination, and lots of colors. And so when we have the rainbow, we can start soft, get louder, and come down. Well, when we speak sentences, we do the same thing. We start soft, and then we go through the sentence and get softer again. And that makes the shape as a rainbow. Well, if we play two phrases, that has one rainbow here and one rainbow here. So there are two next to each other, but we also have one large rainbow over the two of them. So the succession of rainbows is so interesting because not only do we have one that looks like this, and then one that looks like this after it. But then we have the rainbow on top of those. So everything comes with an arc. Let me just play a piece and think to myself, how uh, can I play things so that it sounds that music is a succession of rainbows? <laughs> And you can see how making that diminuendo, especially at the end, is very difficult, but it is the heart of the music. So great musicians must spend a lot of time practicing making diminuendos and making sure that everything in their playing that they would be doing forte is still there when you're playing piano. I'm talking vibrato, tone color, tone quality, etc., etc. So it takes a lot of control to make diminuendos and is well worth practicing. The May song in Suzuki Book One is also good to think about rainbows. It's a very simple song, but it gives us the opportunity to phrase really beautifully. <laughs> And that reminds me of another concept that I learned from Casals in the Art of Interpretation. And that is, if you play the same thing twice, make it different so that it's more interesting. And people love to listen to that. So if you say the same thing twice, if you say the same thing twice, say it differently. Say it differently. You see how I'm talking like that? Well, the playing is the same way. So you'll notice in that May song that I just played that when I played this the first time, that I play it differently the second time. And when I play it this way the first time, Then the second time, I can say it like that. And my playing takes on a great deal of variety. I love the Suzuki books, especially the early ones, because most of the pieces are quite repetitive and it gives me the opportunity of coming up with different musical ideas. Listen to Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. There you'll see there's a variety. When the notes went down, I diminuendoed. But when I played something that was the same two times, I played it completely differently. And I love doing that. Another great thing that I learned in Casals in the Art of Interpretation 
is that Casals tells us that character is more important than having a beautiful sound in music. If you don't have character, your great sound does not carry. So don't think that it's not important to have a great sound. Of course you want to have a great sound, but having character when you're playing is so important. So I'm going to play a piece called Witch's Dance from Suzuki book number two and try to inject a little bit of character in there. My sound was good enough, but I had a lot of character. And the character is what people want to hear when you're playing music. Finally, one more thing that I learned from this book that's so important is that each time that you play a long note, that that long note needs to have some sort of direction. And it sometimes is difficult to figure out which direction that is. But generally, when you play a long note, you either want to make some sort of a crescendo or some sort of a diminuendo, or maybe a crescendo and a diminuendo. But you need to do something with that note to add direction and also to get to the next thing that you're playing. So I'm going to play a piece here and we'll see when I play the longer notes if I can engage and make that longer note move to something else. something like that. And in there you can hear. All right, hey everybody. Welcome to the live stream. Let's see if there's anybody on yet. Hey Birdie Wooster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, welcome to today's live stream. Let's see, let me get my lower thirds happening. Let's see, how do I do that? Didn't notice that. Uh, I'll find it. There it is. All right. Voila. Oops. Gonna move it a little bit. Okay. All right. So I hope you all are doing wonderful. And uh, I know Birdie Wooster catches all of these, or just about all of them. Uh, I think this will be fun for us all to know that we're, we're this is the final live stream that's going to be uh, about the Casals book, and um, today we're going to talk about the last the last real chapter and the epilogue, and then we're going to do something that I had sort of been thinking about the whole time, which is just spend the majority of a live stream just watching Casals work so watching him play the cello watching him rehearse an orchestra um, watching him conduct an orchestra and uh, watching him uh, teach and then I found a, a nice BBC documentary um, about Pablo Casals which is great and hopefully won't cause too much problems in terms of uh, copyright violations, it's so hard to know. Um, it seems like a lot of Casal stuff, even informal footage, has been released as sort of products, which is, which is what it is. That's that's the age we live in. Um, but it means that it's all subject to the automatic algorithmic filters. I always start the streams with this. I'm either talking about my setup, or I'm talking about the. Mm, machinations of doing a live stream which involves the works uh, of other people um, which is the, the purpose of this live stream it's been really nice to spend this 
I think it's seven live streams now. I'm pretty sure because this is chapter seven and I think we've done one live stream for each chapter. I definitely skipped one or two in there due to things going on. Um, and um, th it's it's been really wonderful. I was reflecting. I've got like some, some major challenges in my life with family going on right now. And I was just reflecting having finished this book and the way that the book the way that the author finishes the book that this is the to be like quote unquote forced forced because you know I have like the live stream deadline so it's it's a wonderful so actually somebody sent me an email um, r requesting some more info in the book I think that this uh, musician fa fabulous musician like had maybe caught in the middle of these seven live streams you know it's like what's that book that you're talking about so uh, we exchanged a few emails and we were talking about the difficulty of finishing a book, you know, just being a slow reader and all that stuff. And I said, yeah, if it wasn't for having to cover it on the live streams, I'm, I'm sure that I wouldn't have finished the book and nor has have like gone into it this thoroughly. It's just, I don't know, some people are great readers and some aren't. Um, I'm not. But to be to. So that's what I mean by force. But to spend many hours for seven weeks now, um, contemplating and living with the the ideas and the spirit of Pablo Casals is really a great thing, um, and I and the epilogue captures that, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really nice. His he's always searching for the life and the beauty and the truth. The um, sincerity uh, and, and that gives a kind of a clarity and a presence and just a, a good feeling for me at least it's, it's very nice to be anchored to that um, okay so before we go too much further I want to do a quick quick little bit of plugging just for anybody who wants to sign up but has not signed up yet um, I'll try to make this quick. So starting in a couple weeks, um, I'll be actually starting in, in one week. Um, I'll be running, let's see, here we go. I'll be running these four group classes. Why did this picture not load? That's weird. Okay, there's some sort of problem with this picture. I'll have to fix that. Um, but uh, what's what picture is missing? Oh, the, yeah, beginning beautifully. Uh, picture that's weird I don't know why that's broken but it is um, I keep trying to refresh the page bizarre anyways I'm running um, technically four group classes the accordion yoga is gonna be really fun it's really chill it is a comp it accompanies a 999 membership um, monthly recurring membership which is not that much money and this is the best way to support the live stream um, so I will be plugging this continuously. This will always be there. And if you like these live streams and you want to give back or, or make it a little easier for me to do this by helping me pay my bills, um, that that's the best way to support the live stream is by signing up for this link. So the accordion yoga link links to this thing that's called the premium membership. And then that you get the accordion yoga. Accordion yoga is going to be an awesome class, which is going to meet probably three times a week. Um, for an hour each time and it's going to work on deep listening and moving slow and watching our bodies and building wonderful control uh, from a place of uh, a relaxed strength and a constantly letting go of tension that we don't need. I think it's going to be really wonderful for all of us. Um, I'm running two levels of uh, slow blues class. That's going to be really cool. I'm at 7 o'clock Eastern on Monday nights. I'm running the beginner class and then about an hour later so 8 15 to 9 15 eastern time i'm running the advanced class for so slow blues and the two songs that we're going to cover in that are route 66 and saint james infirmary blues that's gonna be really cool um those would be great group classes and then the one that i don't have an image for today right now is the beginning beautifully class which is a group class of mixed levels but it's perfect for people who are beginners or people who want to return to focusing on many of the elements that we've been talking about in these um, live streams. So 
finding yourself, finding the, what the phrase is supposed to do, um, making the phrases come alive, both with vivacity of, of like our inner humanness, which is like the first place to start, as we'll review in the Pablo Casals book, but also uh, mechanically how to do that on the accordion. And if we, if we get really wrapped up in just the mechanics, I think we can feel very divorced from our very separate from our the thing that we love about music but if we say if we focus on the music part we use our voices and our imagination and our creativity then the mechanics become so much easier and and we we just flourish that way so that's the beginning beautifully class um i'll have to fix that image but that's a really that's a class that i'm very excited about okay that's it for the plugs now um change my chiron Doop. okay um yeah so let, let's get right into it i say um i want to keep my eye on the live stream hey hey can cofernicus hey cofernicus thanks for popping a, a hello in the chat here uh happy to have you watching um okay so the last chapters in the book are chapter seven and the title of chapter seven, I'll hold it up here, is uh, chapter seven, A Casals Rehearsal, The Pastoral Symphony. The Pastoral Symphony is a symphony by Beethoven, one of his great symphonies. Pardon me. And um, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and what chapter seven does is it goes measure by measure, really grouping measures uh, together, grouping small sections together. And it very thoroughly and meticulously, so let's see, I wanna show you that right here. He, uh, he's talking about measures one through four of the, the first movement of the Pastoral Symphony. And then you have uh, what happens in bar three and this fermata, and then measures 11 and 13 and 28 and 30 and, um, so the author, David Blum, goes through uh, multiple rehearsals uh, and collects uh, these, the, the way that Casals found and interpreted the music and the way he sculpted the orchestra to put that music out there. And it's, it's really fabulous, but I think it doesn't, um, because of the copyright limitations, it, it really doesn't behoove me to go deeply into that, uh, with the exception, again, of the first essentially the first couple pages of the chapter which set the tone as do all the chapters in this book um he gives us sort of the the thesis of the chapter the overview and then gets very in-depth uh into the the uh, actionable understandable um mechanisms of exactly what casals would do to the music which is great um so i'm gonna start right there and uh, read a little bit uh, to put you in the, in the vibe. So um, let's see. I'm going to start with the second paragraph here. Casals shared with Beethoven a profound love of nature. One day when I was speaking with Casals on the terrace of his home in San Juan, Puerto Rico, our conversation was interrupted by the raucous squawk of a seagull. He pointed to the bird enthusiastically and, after observing it for some moments, commented, you never lose time when contemplating nature. You never lose time when contemplating nature. Beautiful. He went on to speak of his daily walks on the beach, of the dogs who befriended him on these excursions, of the ever-changing beauty of ocean and sky. He was at one with Beethoven in believing that nature is the best, quote, school for the heart, and, like the composer, to whom every tree seemed to say, quote, Holy, exclamation point, holy. The manifestations of nature were, for Casals, reflections of the divinity. So this is talking about the spiritual nature, but, but just the beauty of, of the world and life. And th that theme is going to be brought up again in the epilogue, which I think is really fantastic. Um, okay, so that's on sort of Casals. Hey, Morgan. I noticed Morgan's watching the chat. All right. So, um, and then just a couple, one sentence, two sentences from the next paragraph, which is um, because this chapter is about the pastoral symphony. His, pe pe hi pardon me, his performance of the pastoral symphony infused with joy and reverence 
was one of the most exquisite treasures he gave to us, period. It was never recorded, although this loss is irreparable in noting here Casal's interpretive indications, something of the letter and perhaps spirit of his conception may be preserved. Now, it may be true that Casal's never recorded in a studio um, the Pastoral Symphony, but I want to show you that uh, online. Um, let's see, let me go here. Oops, I'm in the wrong window here. There we go. Um, and I'll go to my playlist here. Yeah, okay, so I have to be careful. All right, I don't want that to play, but there is a fantastic recording which I listened to most of today and I, I look forward to listening to more of it and I'm struck by this whole process of these seven weeks uh, listening differently to classical music than I have ever before in my life um, I think has slightly changed my listening ear and I notice what I would uh, say for lack of a better word clarity a, a clarity of idea and intention in the orchestra's performance here. Um, so th this, let's see, let me scroll down. You know what, I, I like to keep my chirons here. So let me keep that and just adjust the way that this sits. And we must give credit to the YouTube channel. There we go. We must give attribution. Okay. So this does exist. It's part of the Marlboro Festival Orchestra. Um, does it give us the year? 1969, recorded uh, for the Marlboro Festival in Marlboro, Vermont. So I said, oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know where Marlboro is. I think there's a Marlboro in North Carolina. Um, I could be wrong. Uh, Maybe it's just from my, anyways, I looked it up online and I found that there is a Marlboro Festival website and there's a, a whole wonderful um, posting uh, on the site about Pablo Casals' involvement with this uh, festival over the years. Very cool. And uh, I thought we could, although we, I don't want to listen to, to this performance because I, it is, you can see here, YouTube Premium. I'll get copyright struck, but I suggest you all do. It's just gorgeous. And if you have the book, follow along um, with with chapter seven. It's it's absolutely fascinating. And you get to hear um, really a lot of examples, you know, of this. So that's pretty cool. Um, so this also, there's also a cool thing. I, I thought it would be boring if I read this, but there's this neat little interactive slideshow that is a timeline on the bottom. And then these little slides with uh, biographical information about the life and career of Pablo Casals. This is pretty cool. So this is so Casals was born in 1876 uh, in the region of Catalonia in Spain, and then you can see his early life and his performances and stuff, and World War One and the occupation by Franco of Spain and all this kind of stuff. Um, very very fascinating stuff. Um, it has a section when he got into the Bach, let's see, the Bach cello suites, when he found the Bach cello suites, when he's 13. Very cool. This is a neat little thing. But we're going to watch this, um, Casals at Marlboro. Uh, I think it's about 15 minutes. I thought this would be great. This is, says that it's filmed in celebration of Pablo Casals' 91st birthday, um, made by Bell Telephone, the Bell Telephone Hour. Uh, special on Casals uh, features illuminating comments from Rudolf Serkin and Maestro Casals, as well as a glimpse into the Marlboro rehearsals at this time. So here we go. <laughs> Hi, Duck Brook. Che! Da 
بعدين نشيل سكر نوم دراي which means that the cold has to be more diminuendo also as to be able to hear that second note. Ah, diminuendo, sí, diminuendo, diminuendo in the forte, diminuendo in the forte, a diminuendo that can arrive till the piano and is marked forte. Now, let's hear it. <laughs> and honored guest. His contribution was wonderful, but he only could always stay two to three weeks at the most. And this is the first summer where he could stay all summer. And his presence is just inspiration to all of us. Just his presence as a listener, you know, comes in the hall and we perform. You know, I feel everybody plays better than better. Pianissimo the trumpet, yes, pianissimo. You can do it so well. Rum, 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 rum. Pianissimo. No. Pianissimo. No. No. Rega, 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 rega. Not piano subito. In the piano. The piano has a big margin also, yes? Very well. Now. Rega, 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 rega. Otherwise, you have to understand by yourselves. We come from a forte. And generally, and generally, we play more forte than forte. Done, eh? generally. Well, subito piano. If you do piano, subito is not absolutely not correct. Eh? Eh, well, there must be something to prepare the piano. <laughs> Well, it's so fascinating, so fascinating. There must be something to prepare the piano. So we're going to get to piano, but if you go to piano immediately, it doesn't work. And I, <clears throat> I imagine that's because it gets lost. It becomes so small that the ear can't follow it. Maybe you know, this is just I'm just theorizing. You guys probably have your own understandings of it. And this, <clears throat> this has been discussed throughout the book that there are ranges that we we must understand that things that are marked piano and things that are marked forte and that we intend to play at a particular volume inside of that you know they they have a life that there's more piano and less piano but you mean window which is not marked but it has to be so otherwise the music written is not is not heard hmm? yes sir. Well, I think one could call it maybe a place to learn second violin, to how to play second violin, or play inner voices. There are so many who are brilliant players who never thought of doing it or never had opportunities to accompany or to play a second violin. You were not quite all right, uh, you know, one place, feeling better. It was very good to begin. Yeah, but but yeah, there were a few years with the AIDS, you know, you were not feeling, you know, <clears throat> feeling bad. Come, stop again. You play your own, don't listen to him. Come. Oh, yeah. But he I'm sorry, I can't well, try to. Come. That's what you have to. <laughs>
way that naturally becomes a school of humility to the fact the human relationship among all the groups. Maybe is it what you call spirit of Marvel, that to serve music together with all the fellow musicians. <laughs> And from the Beethoven of 1792 to the Schoenberg of 1946, Felix Gallimer and two younger musicians tackle the trio for strings by Arnold Schoenberg. Marlboro is not centered only in the previous two centuries. A great deal of contemporary music is also studied. Trout Quintet, hour after hour of rehearsal to get the perfect ensemble, the last nuance. Serkin is one of the finest Schubert pianists alive. Wow. Gorgeous. All these performances, even the Scharenberg and the, the uh, Serkin, um, more the modern, I think we would call it, stuff, there's 
a touch of warmth in it, especially the Scherenberg. I feel like I'm used to hearing Scherenberg and that serialism played with such severity. Uh, even though that was a, like a little snippet, it seemed to have this kind of warmth and, I don't know, elasticity that I'm not used to hearing it played with. Well, then, no. No, sing it, sing, sing that thing. Now do that. Yes, those are not scales. You see, they, they, they speak, they speak. And one can, it's so beautiful, so, uh, so beautiful. Not a scale, not a scale. Now, now, very well. Now, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Good, I hear it. planned. Just we started Mr. Adolf Bush, the great artist. My father-in-law, he had that idea and started it in 1950. And when he died in 1951, I continued earlier to make it kind of a living memorial for him. His idea was to have experienced musicians play with less experienced, highly qualified musicians. That's right. to have such wonderful, wonderful orchestras. The qualities are not conceived there. Everyone is equal. Everyone has the love for the music. And they, well, this is the best part of, of, of their lives. It's, it's like a temple of music. It is what I consider Marlborough is. Cool. Nineteen sixty-seven. Fantastic. You just can't listen to any Casals and kind of let your mind wander. I, to me, it seems like now nah, I don't know. You out there might might, uh, who I don't know. Who who knows what's going on right in all of our lives? Your mind could wander. One's mind could wander at any moment, given their circumstances. However, 
the 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 music Casals finds in his interpretation is uh, keeps us wrapped. Okay, so like I said, the um, in chapter seven, it's it's a uh, f basically phrase by phrase, essentially, you know, of of the the important parts of all five movements, and it it goes uh, into great detail, and it's really really fascinating. Um, and thrilling, and you can find that performance, like I said, uh, uh, of the Pastoral Symphony, of which is described in the final chapter, um, on, on YouTube, and I'll have, for each of these live streams, I have a YouTube playlist that's on the Rising Read channel, you can find it, uh, different from the, the recording of the live stream, but a YouTube playlist that has, um, if I've done it right, it has everything that we've looked at and often has things that we don't get to. Um, but you can find that there. Um, I'm curious, when is the Marlboro Festival in Vermont? I mean, it must be in the summer, right? Let's see, summer concerts, overview and dates. July 13th to August 11th, it just ended. Five weeks, very cool. Friday, Saturday, Sunday tickets, fascinating. We do not know concert repertoire or personnel more than a week in advance. Very cool. Very cool. Learn and listen. Lots of stuff here. Very neat. I had not heard of that before. Okay. So so that's the last chapter of the book, which, which is wonderful and filled with um, some reviews, you know, Casal saying, you know, every phrase is a rainbow and, and, you know, just the application of all his, his ideas. Um, so on to the epilogue. The epilogue has a few places that I want to read to you because it's a, it's a beautiful closing of the book. I think the author David Blum just took us on our, it's a, it's a great book. It's a really great book um, that makes us feel inspired to find beauty and then it has very applicable, practical things. The perfect balance of both. Um, okay, so the I'm going to read a little bit from the epilogue. It's short, and I won't read very much. But um, so the epilogue talks about is basically the story of uh, the author David Blum's last visit with Pablo Casals. He visits him at his home in Puerto Rico, where Casals lived with. Um, his young wife that he married when he was 80 and she was 20, um, which we may get to in one of these BBC documentaries. Uh, but she was from Puerto Rico, and as was Pablo Casals' mother. Um, and Casals lived there toward the end of his life and uh, ran a, a uh, was the, I guess, artistic director and main conductor of a music festival in Puerto Rico, um, of which there are numerous recordings from. Okay, so they went to, the author and his wife and his daughter went to visit Casals, and these are the interesting things that I've picked out. So first, uh, he, being Casals, told us, being David Blum and his family, of his playing two preludes and fugues from the well-tempered clavier, quote, every day of my life. I love all the music, but I could not begin the day with another composer. Bach showed us what music is, Bach, oh, pardon me, first comes Bach, then all the others. So how about that? Pretty cool. And then Casals then brought out his treasures. This is pretty cool. So Casals had a page upon which Mozart had written the conclusion, in, in Mozart's, this is original, Mozart's writing, written the conclusion of the third act of The Marriage of Figaro. Pretty amazing. Uh, Casals had the manuscript, handwritten, of Brahms' string quartet in B flat major, and he had the sketch, Beethoven's handwritten sketch for the Ninth Symphony, which, like all those, must be in, in a museum somewhere. Um, and I'll paraphrase this, but uh, the author says that they talked about stage fright, and Casals confessed that even when he was a child, he had stage fright, and he had stage fright his entire career. And it's always something that I suffer from, even today, when I must give a concert, he says. Um, okay, then this part, which I think is a wonderful, um, I think really important part of the thing. 
and I'm going to preface this by saying that one one thing that has struck me from the work of Jacques, Jacques Mornay, who we have spoken about many times on the stream, he's a living um, a man a pedagogue in his 80s uh, from France and runs the Cinema Music School along with his co-founder and co-teacher, Natalie Bouchex. But Jacques, in his master classes, uh, when, you, when you go there, you take these group classes, collectives, class collective, collective classes, where he masterfully teaches everybody all at once. It doesn't matter what level you are, it's just are you new to his teachings or not. He teaches you the fundamentals of the technique that, that in, a, in a very efficient and effective way. Um, and then the rest of the, the stage intensive, you work in individual lessons. And you have two of these class cl collective classes every day um, while you're there. Uh, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. You only have one, I think. Anyway, they're wonderful. But one of the things that struck me, and I've been to, I don't know, a bunch of these now, five maybe or something, or maybe more, um, is he says, uh, very self-assured, that playing music is about sharing with humanity, sharing with the people around you. And you must love, I'll use the phrase, your fellow man. You, you must love and give love to the world, the world of people around you. Um, and he goes further and he says, if you, if you can't do that, then you, you have no business being a musician. And I think that is so beautiful, so beautifully stated. You know, he doesn't, he's not saying it from any point of exclusion. He's saying it very adamantly that this is the point. You know, this is where we, from the, the place from which we must make our music and, and this, this is why and how. And I just think that that is uh, so beautiful to be reminded of. And I bring that up because of what I'm going to share. And I think I, it's best to read this long paragraph uh, verbatim from the author. Okay. So, um, so he's talking about uh, Casals meeting David Blum's daughter uh, for the first time, who accompanied David and his wife on this trip to meet Pablo Casals that we're being told of now. And so now this this is the next part that's told. So it says, quote, uh, Pablo Casals, quote, I have an idea, he said to us, a plan for the education of children. I have spoken of it to important people, and they say, it is so simple, yet we have never thought of it. It is this. Pablo Casals' plan for the education of children. As soon as the child can understand the meaning of a word, he should be told that this word represents a miracle. When we speak of the eye, the human eye, we should explain what a miracle it is to be able to see. We should explain what a miracle it is to be able to speak. What a marvel are our hands. When the wonder of each word has been made clear, then every child should be taught to realize I am a miracle and he is also a miracle. And that's what I have in the little Chiron thing down at the bottom because I think that this is uh, the summation of the energy, you know, the intent, the perspective of it all. So I am a miracle and he is also a miracle. I'm going to read verbatim again. I am a unique being. There has never been a person like me since the beginning of the world, nor will there be until our world comes to an end. And he, too, is unique and will be so until our world will end. Therefore, this is the main point, I cannot kill him and he cannot kill me. Only in this way can we do away with the impulse for wars. And that was a major theme for Pablo Casals. Um, 146. Hopefully we'll get to the BBC documentary and they will talk about his uh, anti-war activism, his peace. Uh, he was awarded the, the peace prize by the UN um, working for wars and armistice across the world was a major factor and for uh, inclusion of war, refugees and all that sort of stuff from Spain and from everywhere basically. So um, continuing to read and this is not direct quote, quotes but summary uh, only in this way can we do only in this way 
can we do away with the impulse for wars? At school, they teach that two plus two equals four. That is not what life is all about. Okay, there we go. Casals uttered the words, I am a miracle and he is also a miracle. He struck his hands to his chest. His blue eyes shone with indescribable radiance. He experienced fully the marvel of which he spoke. Looking into those eyes, I thought not of the frail body which contained them, but of the transcendent spirit which resided there. All right. So that's the, you know, what more profound statement can be said. Uh, profound meaning deep. Um, and for us to be reminded of that, I think is, is really great. And that, that is what we're trying to connect with, you know. What a beautiful way to make a full circle of, of this, the ideas here and what we're after. And I have just a few more things underlined, just a couple more, and that will be the end of the epilogue. Um, Casals continued, quote, Real understanding does not come from what we learn in books. It comes from what we learn from love. I'll say that part again. It comes from what we learn from love love of nature, of music, of man. For only what is learned in that way is truly understood. And continuing the quote, I cannot believe that these marvels which surround us, the miracle which is life, can come from nothingness. How can something come from nothingness? The miracle must come from somewhere. Casal says it comes from God. Um, and then the last, the last little bit I've underlined to share with you, uh, Casal says, when you reach my age, he said, anything can happen at any time. I am prepared for it. So I love all the more every beautiful thing. How moved I am to be among my friends. So beautiful. So, so, so beautiful. And that's the end of the book. Um, and what a, what a wonderful book it was. What a wonderful experience this was sharing this with you all um let me check out the chat see if there's anything no no notes from the chat cool all right so now what i have for the rest of the stream is to rather than breaking apart the the chapters and coming up with youtube references and stuff for the for the chapters um i thought it would be good a, a wonderful thing just to look at Casals in his own words and his own notes, whether the conductor's baton or the uh, bow of the cello or, you know, instructing, and talking about music with, with people. Um, so I have collected some cool stuff, some stuff. Let's start with some stuff, some box stuff that I wish I would have showed last week. Um, we'll go here. Let's see, we have... This is so weird. I swear that I add things to this playlist and then I don't see them here. Um, okay. So. Let me search for this. There's Pablo Casals rehearsing the Brandenburg Concerto. Here we go. This is great. Okay. Let us try. Only there's the two, the two first notes on every four. But let us try. For me, it's my is He's gonna sing it. 
So further understanding where the melody is or, or what's the important part of the melody. So it's the, what's written is um, um, and he's saying hear it as one, just one note, that the second note is like an ornament of that, you know. And put the emphasis on the first of the, of yeah. that. I always Make them sense. That abnormal, unmusical. I always find it that. This is the way the Casella used to speak. We should talk. Ta 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 Casella used to that. We shall go there, la 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 and then la da di la da yi. And there's the rainbow. Um, di pa pa si pa 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 pa. See if we can sing it. La da di la da yi di ya re. Tri di ro. And then la da di la da. La da da di da di da di la da 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 di da 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 ya da 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 da. That e is weak. La di la ye yum pum. Beep beep bum 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 bum. Um. Ding dum. So we have the the rainbow. Lum bum. Right. Ba bum. It's uh. It goes up and it comes down, and you can hear him sing it. You can see the rainbow there. And then la da di la da yi di yare. No. Tri di da di tra di yi di yare. No. Yo pa 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 Okay, that's enough of that because I want to watch more video of Casals because when, you, we, when we watch the video, we see the movement of his body and that just everything just marries in terms of understanding this. Um, all right, let's see. Let me go to my notes here. Um, we talked about that and that. Okay, what would be nice to watch now? Um... We watched that. Ah, yeah, okay. All right, so. Let's watch this. Oh, this one's cool. These are longer, so we're not gonna watch all of them. But there are vi movies, film, of Casals doing these master classes with cellists, um, performing like concert cello, working on concert cello pieces, featuring the cello. Um, this is some Brahms piece, but I'm not sure which one it is. Let's go to the beginning. I think it's a Brahms piece. Do I know that for a fact? That's what I've written down. Maybe it says. And this is cool because this was obviously film and then whoever made this YouTube video like recorded that, which is pretty cool. Um, let me check my phone here. Ah, uh, okay. I'm gonna play and then I gotta go check my phone for something important here.
Okay. Uh, wait, I don't hear myself. Oh, because I turned that down. Because that video was pretty loud. Okay. Um, alrighty. Let's see. So, Casals, I know about halfway through he gets into some good stuff. Let's skip there. Not one, two. Ah, yeah, this is cool. Okay. He's talking about the rhythm. Count the eights. Count the eights. Very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, fast movement. This is what counts. Not one, two. This is what counts. One, two, three, Okay, this is a little a little dry for us all to watch. Um, let's let's see. Let's go to uh, what do I have here for this? Um, that's nice. Oh yeah. Okay, let's listen to a little bit of this. This is about two and a half minutes of Casals rehearsing the Beethoven Symphony, the Eroica or Heroic, um, in Puerto Rico in 1964. <laughs> Let's check out that BBC documentary. 
It's on my playlist called Pablo Casals. Um, yeah, we'll watch some of this. And uh, the the pre-stream uh, video I played was the one that inspired me, the one that told us about that book in the first place, which is Ronald Houston's fantastic video. Um, Ronald Houston is a violist. And uh, the title of this video is Play More Musically on Viola Using the Simple Pieces, Using the Most Simple Pieces to Sound More Musical. But this is about, um, it's about this book. And this, that's where we heard about this book. Um, okay, so on to this BBC documentary, which is from, is do we have a, a year for it? I don't know if we do. The way he no it's not this one there are a number of uh, documentaries and films put together after the fact or filmed while Casals was living okay we don't know but that's all right That buzzing is in the video. Whole big pile of bunch of books about Pablo Casals. Suites are so fiendishly difficult to play, even if you have more than a schoolboy technique. Casals discovered the suites in a Barcelona music store, and he made them his own. He practiced every morning before breakfast. He played one before breakfast. He said it sanctified the house. Cellists ever since have been struggling to get it right. I don't think that the, the Bach suites alone were the, the reason for his enormous uh, artistic success. I think that every time he put the bow on the cello, he had something to say that people understood. It was, it was uh, speech, speech as, as pure and simple as, as poetry. His magic was touching something very profound in the music. It was giving life to all of that, and he could transmit that life. Even when he was 95, 96, you can see rehearsals, clips of rehearsals that have been done, whereupon he arrives on the podium very slowly, and all of a sudden there's all that energy that exuded. And that was Casal, so you can imagine when he was 20 or 30, I, I wish I would have been around to see it. That was Pablo Casal's wife. This is where I would love to listen to this, but I feel like that's where we might get in a little bit of trouble. It's with the actual recordings of Casals. His life. Casals was born in 1876. That's a good while before the motor car was invented. And he died 97 years later, four years after man walked on the moon. Again, Casals at 23 played for Queen Victoria at Osborne. 
at age 85, he played for John F. Kennedy at the White House. That, that seems to me an enormous chronological time span to take into account. I don't want to, I'm trying to skip past the parts where we're hearing a lot of the beautiful orchestra music because it's probably been uploaded to the streaming so, services. So, uh, this is why I dedicated uh, my time and my everything to those people. I think that the, if I have done one thing in my life well, it was that. By 1936, Casals. Uh, was a world famous cello virtuoso. He was a widely known conductor. He was an outspoken Republican. Uh, some people still in Spain have not forgiven him for not being a monarchist because he had he had the, uh, the patronage of, of the royal family when he was 18. But he was all these things. The, the war came, and he wanted to be in Spain with his people, despite all, all the horrors. Uh, he was prevailed on to continue his concert career because the politicians and others said, you can get our message out much better if you will play and speak. I'm gonna mute that. Sorry. It's so good, but Catalonia? What do you mean, Catalonia? Uh, the situation was so sad, <coughs> so sad. I was a neurasthenic, got a neurasthenia in Paris. I, I was more than one month, everything closed, I didn't want to see the light. See, I was in a, uh, was a wreck. Very well, one day came a friend of mine, a Catalan, and said, Please, but please, come to Catalonia. Catalonia? What do you mean, Catalonia? Uh, yes, Catalonia, uh, French Catalonia. And this is why I came to Prague. train. Or a French train? Prods. Okay, it's a commune in France. All right. French. I know what that writing looks like. <laughs> I think one thing to remember about Casals is that he had lived a considerable life even before he left Spain. He was, after all, over 60. He didn't expect to in, in, invite exile, but it did give him um, a colossal new um, phase of his life, which was not all painful. He came with Signora Captavilla, one of his former pupils, who, a widow, 
who had been entrusted to his safekeeping in a way and who had lived on his estate in San Salvador during the 1930s. It's so sad to have to mute the music of Casals, but I have to. Relationship and, and a very close one. And it is noticeable that the only occasion on which Casals returned to Spain after exile in 1939 was to bury um, Senora Capdevila whom he had married on her deathbed and then took back to San Salvador to bury, to bury her next to his mother. That was a, a major statement of affection. In the south of France, beneath snow-capped Pyrenees, which bar the road to Spain, stands the ancient village of Prade. Since 1945, Prade has become a place of pilgrimage for musicians and music lovers from all over the world. Mm. They come here to visit and to study with the foremost cellist of our era, the great Spanish artist living in self-imposed exile, Pablo Casals. We should not listen to this either. Uh, this is just kind of a drag, but... Um, this, that piece is called The Song of the Birds, which is one of Casal's trademark pieces that I was going to play at the very end of the stream because I found a version of him playing it on an, an old piece of film. Espanol Pablo Casals, qui réside à Prat depuis 12 ans, et dirige un festival Jean-Sébastien Bach en l'honneur du deuxième centenaire de la mort du grand musicien de Leipzig. Alexander Schneider, who had come to study the Bach, uh, suites with him, the Partitas, had asked him to come to make records for Columbia Records in New York. And uh, he had refused in spite of a, a wonderful offer from Columbia Records. And Schneider's idea was then to say, well, if, if you won't come to America, we'll bring America to you. We'll, we'll start a festival here in Prague. And that's how it all started. I visited him in 48 first. Then I started with him in 49 and cooked for him <laughs> too, because I, I am professionally a cook. I just play a little bit to make money, you know, to cook. <laughs> 14th of July, I came for dinner in Prades with Madame Cap de Villa, you know, who was his friend, who, who was really devoted to him. And after dinner, I asked him again, why don't you come to America? We all want you there. He said, no. So long as you recognize Franco, I am not going to. I don't go anywhere where Franco is recognized. So I said, how would that be? There's 200 years of, of, the, of the birth of Bach. To have a Bach festival, we all come to you. He looked at me, looked at me, and started laughing. He said, well, this little boy, he's not going to take it serious. He said, all right, I promise you I will do it. Shook hands. And that's how it happened. Mm, sorry. The cafe, the restaurants, there was a lot of fun. We had a Turkeys, I guess, or chickens. 
Euh, nous voyons ici cette photo qui est, à mon sens, merveilleuse, je dis génial polichinelle. On dirait vraiment un homme polichinelle et puis qui tout d'un coup rebondit pour euh, euh, maniant euh, la baguette et l'oreille pour alors s'élancer dans... Euh, pour vraiment posséder euh, sa musique et son orchestre. Ce sont des photos, c'est mon grand-père euh, Alexandre. Toutes ces photos représentent une sorte de rétrospective des premières années du festival. beautiful pieces of music you'll all have to watch this on your own with the real music we need liberty we we want to do our best in everything. So my neighbor, my friend, must have the same feelings that I have. This is why the wars are such a devilish thing. You see, the, the, your government says, go and kill. Well, you, you don't want to kill anybody, then you have to go. It's terrible, it's horrible. And this is why I don't conceive a country with a dictator. I am a simple man. I don't like complications. The same in music. I like what is natural. To give what the music demands, and I try to do my best. The same in life. And for me, this is civilization. For me, he was the most honest musician I had ever known. And his way of making music was, for me, the only way. Playing with Casals was an extraordinary musical experience. Um, he was, he always reminded me of a jeweler. Uh, meticulous and precise and looking for the tiniest, tiniest little elements. And that is a way a musical interpretation is built up. You have to envision the grand, the, the complete, the, the global, as it were. You have to see the great lines. You have to see the whole structure. But then, when you are putting it together, you have to be aware of the smallest, smallest details. <laughs> It was all from here. And physically. For example, he would say to the chair, move! Don't sit like that, straight like that, you know, like mummies. He hated that. He, he felt, well, which, you see, music is a physical expression. And even I remember Schnabel, a great pianist, he would say to the, somebody, he said, move, he said, or make a crescendo, or make pianissimo. So the piano would say, I can't do it because the piano is mechanical. You have to do it, even if he doesn't do it. Very important. We thought about if the instrument doesn't do it, you have to still do it. Today, well, very few, I don't, very few of them do that.
There's a, a beautiful phrase in the C major Beethoven sonata for cello and piano. And he, I, I couldn't do exactly what he wanted. And finally he said, you know, in the fall, the leaves fall off the trees, but they don't fall straight down. They fall with a gentle, caressing motion to the ground. Now you must make your phrase sound like that. And immediately it opened a picture for me of how he wanted that phrase to sound. was amazing to me how he was able to play that instrument because it was uh, reluctant for me at least it was reluctant to give out the sound that i wanted and and he used gut strings uh, of course we've in modern times we use steel on the a and d he was still using gut and they would be frayed and, and ready to break <laughs> and uh, but the sound he got out of that instrument was was something incredible and uh, he would smoke his pipe. He had uh, one of those curved pipes. And uh, I, I say he smoked his pipe, he smoked matches. And every once in a while he'd forget and uh, drop the match and it would always li uh, wind up in the F hole of the cello. And I'm sure there must have been about uh, at least a half a kilo of, of matches down at the bottom of the cello. Didn't affect the sound, but when he, every time he, picked the cello up and shook it, I could hear, I could hear matches rolling around from the bottom of the Gorgeous, need to skip ahead. Every summer they came, every September they spent here. So his earliest memories were of this house. And when he became a wealthy man, he began to construct the house, which we see here. It's as if he wanted to establish something physical in this country, perhaps sensing that he wouldn't always be able to be here. Must have been nine, ten. And it's a small instrument. It's it? a very small instrument and very sweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he played it for two or three years. We have seen photographs uh, of him when he played at the Cafe Tos and all uh, photographs with other musicians, but never playing this instrument, which is curious. It's about that time that he discovered these. It, it was a little later see. when he discovered these um, in an old music store. And ever since the moment he saw them, it was of, of vital importance in his musical life. It was he who was the first to play a whole suite in a concert. And he studied and restudied these works for 13 years before he dared play them in the public because he felt that they were so important and so wonderful. One of the basic uh, works of Johann Sebastian, whom he had great admiration and respect yeah, already as a, a child. Big event in his life. Oh, it that. was and continued to be throughout. Didn't play on this. No, that was the first instrument that his father constructed for him because when he was about seven or eight years old, he went to one of those village celebrations and heard a string quartet and he fell in love with a cello. So he came back home saying he wanted to play a string instrument and his father, uh, after his insistence, said, well, I have no instrument, but I'll make you one. So he made him this gourd. He started immediately playing it like this and uh, played some tune, some... Uh, it's hard to believe you can get a, a noise out of this, isn't not it? Not only that, but his father and the friends of his father were so touched at hearing him play some Ave Maria or some 
tooth that he'd played at the time that uh, it told them that it was serious. So the beginning of his cello career began with that gourd. Mm. Choral music. What is that? They told us here. It's an accordion there. Third, I think. And then the last two. So I from three. His mother was an indomitable woman. At at the end she'd had, I believe, eleven children. Uh of whom three lived. Pablo Casals was the third, I think, and then the last two. So I, she clearly put her belief, her energy, everything into fostering his career, nurturing him in, in the term we would now use. She was a very, very strong woman. Her husband always capitulated to her uh, insistence on what was best for the uh, for the son. All my life, inspired by my mother, who was a wonderful, genial woman. She talked to me very early of my age about peace, about peace. He was totally devoted to his mother. He respected her. He found that she was the most wise woman, the most intelligent, the most moral. I mean, he really had a very veneration for her. And it was actually she who discovered his talent in a way. I mean, his father had brought him to music. His father was a musician. But it was she who believed that he was a real talent, a world talent. And it was she who decided to come uh, with him to Barcelona to go and study further. It was she who decided to bring him to Madrid. It was she who came with him to, to Paris with two little babies and father always stayed home. So it was her strength and her belief in his talent that brought him to. Okay, uh, we're only about halfway through this, but I think it's nice to vary it and change it up a little bit. Let's, um, let's see, where's the book? Right here and go to the chat let's see we got um uh jk jkmt airy uh very moving says very moving ideas as an end to the book and that was said uh maybe half an hour ago or so but yeah i agree jkt or uh, jk <coughs> um so if we do a, just a brief review of the book um the first chapter was the first principle, which is wonderful that we come back to another kind of first principle, which is, is different, but, but uh, as important, right? So at the end of the book, we understand um, a first principle of, of everything is to, to love our fellow you know, human. Um, and to understand that we are each a miracle, we are each spe special, and there's only one of each of us. It's so, so it's, everything is so beautiful in that way, and how could we possibly want to do anything but help each other? The first principle in this book is from the, uh, let's see, what is it? It's right here. The set of six principles from the 5th century AD in China about Chinese painting and uh, my interpretation of this summary of a summary of a translation of a summary or whatever um, is that the, the artist needs to come into communion the same energy the artist needs to be the same energy feel the same things as the art is supposed to while while creating the art right so we need to feel we need to be in communion with the feeling of the art that we're making. I'm going to put my little Chiron up again. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, this is good. All right. Um, and that's it. And then there, you remember there was a bunch of stories about uh, Casals 
doing that and especially when uh rehearsing the orchestra which a lot of those vignettes were him feeling joy and feeling sorrow and madness and all this sort of thing the second chapter was finding the design which was about understanding this was the the book where right under here there's like a pull quote at the top remember that all music in general is a succession of rainbows and that idea of rainbows of shaping the phrases to build a tension maybe build a tension and have a release have an up and a down and uh, it doesn't have to be symmetrical and i think in my application it doesn't have to be each phrase doesn't have to do that pairs of phrases could do that you know you could have this this phrase is essentially coming up or, or down or whatever it is just a guide for for the the energy that music seems to want to have um that was really fantastic and the, in that first, in the second chapter, which is really the first one that's explicitly about uh, doing things to music, we start to get told you have to do, you have to do way more than, than is written on the page, which becomes a theme reiterated over and over and over and over again in many broad and specific ways. Okay. Yeah, it's really fantastic. And then we have this, uh, the next chapter was Diction for Instrumentalists, which was really fascinating. And in that, he talked about um, uh, the use of diminuendo and how uh, that relaxation of, of the tension adds, it, first of all, it's, it's how we speak, and it adds these, this quality to the, to the phrasing. Um, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, right? That's that's right at the beginning, but it's a good. It's one that I remember. And imagine if that was stated not like that. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse, right? So, all along, it's it's referring back. How would you sing it? You know, because when we sing, we're very much alive, even if we're bad singers. If we sing, uh, frankly, that's another poll quote I remember from numerous places in this book. Play, play frankly, Casals would say. So if we sing frankly, um, then we cannot help but being musical. It's, it's part of our humanness. Perceiving time relationships. This was great, and I got some wonderful emails from people with, with uh, resources. This is one that I remember saying, oh, I, I want to understand musical time better. And we, in order to do that, we went and looked at some other um, uh, perspectives on the difference between different, uh, t you know, the, the way classical music feels time, all that sort of thing. That was really fa fantastic. We watched, yeah. Okay. Chapter five was insights for string players. There was a lot of stuff in there. I remember I, I pulled a lot of uh, different different items out there. Uh, the idea of expressive intonation was one. We looked at some videos about that. Uh, the use of the bow, when we talked about using the bow, thinking of our left, ar left arm of the accordion. Uh, like the bow that was really f phenomenal let's see there was a bunch of stuff there but i think i didn't underline it in the book <laughs> i made the mistake of sometimes doing stuff on my ipad where i highlighted using the apple pencil and then sometimes i underlined stuff in the book <laughs> so some of these chapters are are one or the other okay and then last week's was casals and bach and that was phenomenal and we talked about uh, historical accuracy and the spirituality of Bach and what, what is appropriate to do and not appropriate and how do you know and all that sort of stuff. And then this this week's were, were, were the last two chapters, the epilogue, of course, which I think is the most important for our live stream. And then the chapter on the on Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, which I highly recommend you listen to that Marlboro. It's, it's just uh, so stunning and clear. And that's sort of the, the, the summary. I know, um, for me, the lasting feelings from the book, uh, as, as it's kind of added new ideas and stuff, I, I find that I'm doing much more inner audiation and singing as I'm around the house, or, or uh, either singing out loud or singing in my head, um, and feeling the movement in the sound so rhythm is something that I have pr prior to this book and I suppose it's 
this whole journey with this book is is uh, in the universe of of meeting Jack and Natalie and the cinema ideas, um, uh, which which have to do about these emotive expressive qualities of music that are about the how we play the notes and how we sh shape this sort of pre written music, and not this. Uh, um, uh, other kinds of music folk and popular music and the skills of of the musicianship needed there which is also my tradition before before getting into this stuff but anyway uh just m my sort of continued development is feeling um feeling the flow it's almost like a wave like surfing on a wave or something or riding this thing riding the shape and feeling inside of those notes feeling how the time how they even if it's a an eighth note or a fast note not even or a, of course a long held note but that there's time in that whereas before I would think there is a pulse in my body um, to to feel that that's time and then these these notes are going on top of it, but it's it's challenging to to articulate perfectly in words because it's I'm sort of in flux and transition of it, but feeling more gestural I think in everything and less pointillist more gesture but the gesture has place you know the gesture has time and place there's some things that's fun to see very fun to see Bach uh, to see Casals m moving how he how he moves his body and he's moving it both for his own expression but also in an instructional way in all these examples that we see either re rehearsing with another cellist or rehearsing the orchestra you know he wants them to feel this and this and that movement that there's there's time and space and energy in this sweep as well as in the pulse point he, yes it's here and here and here and here but it's here dun, dun, and then the notes occupy that sort of thing um that's one major way that this that this um moves me and then strengthening and enforcing the idea that really is driven home working with Jack and Natalie, which is uh, shaping phrases, putting emotion into those phrases, um, and the emotion coming. One of the one of the major ways the the emotions coming from is through the the energy of the dynamics, you know, and the use of them and the structuring of those. Uh, um, when I was in France in February for two weeks, it was really fantastic, and I brought my arrangement, relatively simple arrangement of Misty, and uh, I was what I thought I was going to work on, you know, ended up being different than what Jack heard in it, and he wanted to to do with it, and one of the things that he really, really got across to me, which was wonderful, was to use dynamics and emotional quality to shape different phrases. Dwee. Right. I'm doing more uh, rubato time, moving time, than I actually did when playing it. When playing it, I tried to keep the time good, or at least the left hand pulse. Um, but just to show you. Uh, the an example of that very cool very cool and it got me thinking you know even about improvisation I thought oh this is cool so in the practice rooms I started trying to improvise that way you know play over the changes play a phrase that felt more open and expansive and then a phrase that felt more pointed and driving and and uh, um, certain right or or assertive no matter what the emotional quality is that's the interesting thing around it these are the things that uh i'm left with that i'm thinking about at the top of my head now um i wonder what you all i'm gonna go ahead and address yeah hey swing bossa great thanks for joining us i'm gonna let's share what swing bossa has to say in the chat uh swing bossa says this reminds me of things that bill evans talked about putting emotion into the music regardless of your skill level yes 
and Swing Blasta says, I've probably recommended this before, but The Universal Mind of Bill Evans. Uh, I'm going to write that down. You probably have, but I am going to write it down. The Universal Mind of Bill Evans. I'll put that on my list of stuff to check out. And Swing Blasta says, um, while, while jazz focused, it is a fascinating set of ideas and examples including how to free oneself from playing with charts. It's on YouTube. Cool. Very cool. Very, very cool. So so is it a book or is it a video? Let me see if I can find it. Uh, a documentary? Here we go. Let's check it out. Oh, yeah. There it is. Wow. From 1966. That's cool. Oh, yeah. We should totally watch this on the stream, Swing Bossa. This is cool. Maybe the theme can be something like um, expression in improvisation. I think that might be a nice wrapper for this. Very cool. I yeah. I'm I'm not prior. Also, it's not just technical facility, but uh, the brain connection with the arm muscle, so to speak. Uh, developing that facility to the point. That's what's his name? The first Tonight Show guy, right? Um, Oh, Harry Evans. No, that's Harry Evans. Super cool. I thought it was. What's this guy's name? Isn't this the comedian guy? It's not. That's Bill Evans. But who's this guy? That's uh, who am I thinking of? Chat. Uh, anyway. Steve Allen. Thank you. Yes, Steve Allen. Um. All right. Okay, I'm gonna read more of Swing Boss's chat because it's fantastic. Um, yeah, we will we will watch this on a on a future stream. That's great. Uh, Swing Boss also says uh, also Casal seems to stress the importance of being able to sing what you're playing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Swing Boss says I'd also say it's good to know the lyrics to the song even if you're playing it instrumentally. I didn't invent that, but I've heard a number of top players point it out. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Awesome. And thanks, BGR, for, for pasting the YouTube link. Very cool. Awesome. Harry Evans, oh my gosh, who sadly took his own life. It's very sad, but... Wow. Cool. Very cool, everyone. All right. Um, yeah, so this this has been great. This is, I really enjoyed this. I understand the uh, the tenor, the kind of dryness that, that these... Uh, that it leads, you know, it's, it's just a different thing to do with the live stream, I suppose. But that was great. I think it'll be a little while until I do another book club just because it's really all encompassing. I'm working on a few guests uh, in the future and I look forward to having them. Um, I want to end with some of Casal's just playing his music and I know the piece I want to end with, but um, I have three, let's see. Uh, why not? And I think we have listened to this on the stream before, but let's let's listen to the prelude from the first um, Bach cello suite unaccompanied in G major. I'm positive that I've played this on the stream before, but it's it's a classic, and we have Casals to thank for this coming into popularity, at least when it did. Uh, we need to see that, and then we're going to end on uh, his sort of theme song. All right. so much it's not as relaxed as I'm used to hearing it it has so much more direction in the lines
what what direction of line and shaping and and a thing I'm struck by too now in the last like week or so listening is a thing that strikes me is is Casal's expert use of dynamics like when we hear him with the orchestra the way that it gets quieter is so like perfect it's it's not sterile perfect it's musically perfect and so clear that you know that it's it's decrescendoing but it, it's it just feels like the musical thing that's happening and same here and he creates these just beautiful payoffs okay the last piece that we're going to hear today as our goodbye to Pablo Casals for now is uh no not that one it's this one it is the song of the birds which is a catalonian um folk song that casals became very very famous for for playing i think th this is like it's not his composition because it's a folk song but it's his arrangement of it um and there are many many performances of casals uh many many recordings of of casals performing this this is interesting. This is part of some documentary that I found, um, and I, I, it seems like it may be like not gonna trigger the um, copyright infringement robot algorithm. And also, it's beautiful colorized film here. This, I'm guessing, this is in Puerto Rico. We are even invited to hear the great Pablo Casals, who is now 80 years old, playing at the palace of Puerto Rico's governor, Munoz Marin. For us, Mr. Casals plays his favorite Catalan ballad, Song of the Birds. Beautiful. Okay. Let's see, where's the Chiron that has that little quote? This is a good one. I am a miracle, <coughs> and you are a miracle. <laughs> kind of preachy. Uh, but I mean it all just as a message to go on. I need that. My father is quite sick in the hospital. I'm going to go out to California to see him, and it's weighing on me uh, very, very much. Um, and so this is a nice... Uh, Werner Herzog once said, we must fortify ourselves with philosophy. You know, we got to fortify ourselves with something. Friends, beautiful art and music, our, our work, if we can find meaning in it, um, and the gift of being alive. So thanks, everybody. Um, 